Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another demo. Uh, this demo is not going to be about amazing language features that no other language has. Uh, it's going to be about filling in a few gaps uh, that this language previously had not filled in. Right? And so uh, the gap we're going to talk about today is constructors and destructors. And the design of constructors and destructors in this language is very different from most languages. It's especially very different from C++. Um, and I wasn't sure for a long time that I was even going to have constructors or destructors. And I should say, before I say anything else, that I'm not completely sure that everything that I'm going to show today is actually a good idea. It might get ripped out of the language later. Um, but I have what I think is a justification for it that seems to make sense. And so like at the current time, it seems to make sense to go in this direction and do a version of constructors and destructors that provides what I believe is a useful functionality of those kinds of routines uh, without getting into the horrible, miserable rat holes that C++ gets into. All right, so let me talk about why we're doing this in the first place. Um, let me just get some blank lines down here. Uh, da, 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 uh, other value is a float that equals 5.7, right? So when C++ was first uh, first um, well, let's not talk about C++ here. Let's talk about this language. Um, in this language, you don't particularly need uh, constructors most of the time. So for example, if you've got a simple data only object and you want things to be initialized to certain values, so I've got this thing, right, and it's got an int that's 42 and it's got a float that's 5.7, th this is a declarative way of initializing those, right? And you don't need to write a procedure that initializes those values. And almost everything, at least in the kind of code that I want to write, is stuff like this, right? So most of the time I don't need constructors, I don't want them, um, and life is simpler when you don't have to think about them, right? However, I did come up with a couple cases, even for my own programming style, uh, where I found that I wanted them. So let me go here. So here's a, a string builder that I use, like all the print statements that I've demoed and all that kind of stuff uses a string builder. And I'm always trying to minimize how much allocation that happens, right? So the string builder has a linked list of buffers, right? Each buffer is some size, which is set to 16K by default. Um, you know, and then there's some other stuff for tracking where you are in the buffer. and It's a typical thing that you've seen a million times if you've written this kind of program, like as the print function goes along, it fills a buffer, and if the buffer runs out, it gets, it allocates a new one and sets the next pointer, right? Now, the typical case, though, is that strings tend to be short if you're creating them. They tend to be shorter than this buffer size. So you don't want to have to dynamically allocate if you don't have to. And so this string builder has a buffer already stored in it, right? Um, and then if you need more buffers, then uh, where do they go? Oh, they're just chained off of... Um, oh, I think there's a bug in here. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm not actually storing all the buffers. I think my destructor is buggy. Anyway, um, the point being that you allocate more buffers and make a linked list out of them, blah, blah, blah. So when I, const when, I, when I create one of these, um, I want this current buffer to be pointing basically at, at this, right? But then I want the option to point it at a later buffer later on, um, because this always points to sort of the last buffer in the list. Um, there's sort of two ways you could do that, right? So one is you can have this string builder and I can have, you know, in this file, I've got some API of what you do. So I've got 
um, you know, expand the string builder, which allocates a new buffer, or append data uh, of some with some data pointer in some length, right? Or you know, convert it to a string and all that. And on every entry point, I could check an initialized flag on this guy, and if initialize is set to false, set it to true, and then set the current buffer to the base buffer, right? So, so you would never need to construct it explicitly, but if I needed to use it, um, I could set the pointer. The problem with that is um, it's error prone for me as the person writing the library. And it's also uh, discourages what I think one of the fundamental philosophies of this language is, is that, you know, all these things down later, later in this routine are not methods encapsulated inside this struct that only I am allowed to write. Like the, the idea of the language is, look, if you have a different way that you want to treat a string builder, then you can come along and just write functions on it, and they're just, they have just the same amount of authority as any functions that I wrote about the string builder, right? And that starts to be discouraged if in your own code you have to start maintaining this kind of invariant that may not be explained to you, right? And it may not be that simple. Like, initializing current buffer, if it's set to null or something, is not uh, that onerous of a constraint, but it only gets more complex from there, right? And so every once in a while, it's just a good idea to have a constructor. There's also a performance impacts of that. There are a small performance impact, but every procedure that I have down here now has to check that pointer, which has a runtime effect, and it has to contain a procedure call to the initialize routine, which increases code size. So you'd rather not have all that. Um, Although the code size argument is, there are counter arguments to that, <laughs> for sure. In fact, I'm going to rescind the code size argument. I don't think it's a good argument. Um, but anyway, that's a reason why you would like a constructor, right? Is, is in, in cases like this, you want to initialize things. Now, that's still a relatively rare case. I find that most things that I create don't, you know, I don't love dynamically allocating memory all the time because that's slow. So most of the structs that I create don't really want a constructor like that. Um, however, let's say you're writing an API for people to use and you start out and you've got something like this, right? And it's got really just regular data members that don't need very special initialization. But you want your API to be forward compatible, right? Because you want people to be able to use it and upgrade to the newer versions of your library without having a problem. Um, Well, you run into a conundrum, right? So the conundrum is the following. One of the nice things about this language is that if I'm just sitting along writing code and I say thing is a thing, right? And then I, go, I do something with, you know, a pointer to this thing or whatever, this is initialized. And this was all I needed to do to initialize these to this value. And that's very convenient, right? But if you're writing an API and you want the API to, uh, be forward compatible for a long time, then you want to make sure that this code that I wrote down here remains valid if you change thing around, right? So one simple way you might change thing around is you might put a string in there, right? Okay, that works fine. No problem there. It's bigger now, whatever. Nothing I did depended on the size of this or the fact that there's a string member. But if you have a buffer now, like say, uh, you know, Say we have an equivalent thing, right? Or say you've added some memory that needs to be allocated when this thing starts up. I don't necessarily think that's a good idea, but some people do that. Um, or let's pick a simpler one, a serial number, right? Say you've got some int and it's being counted up every time you construct one of these and that's necessary for something in the program, right? Um, as soon as I add one of these things, this code no longer works, all right? So now if I'm defensively creating my API, then even though my thing might be super simple, I have to require you to init the thing because I don't know if someday I'm gonna add members that need explicit initialization. And what's even worse is if I'm gonna be robust against errors, I need to make sure you initted the thing before you used it. 
right? So then I need to go in the rest of my API to thing, and I need to make sure that you initialized it. So even if I don't care, I need to add an initialized right value that's set to false and that this sets to true and does nothing else, right? And then my other code has to take on this complexity and make sure you called init on it just so that one day, if I actually need you to init it, then it's okay. And I need to do this with every single data structure, which is crazy, and it destroys this simplicity that you get of, of just being able to do this, right? So that is my justification for why I'm leaning toward constructors being a good idea. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not totally in that department. Like, I might change my mind someday. But right now, I'm, I'm strongly enough uh, in that category that I went and did all the work to implement constructors and destructors. So, whoops. So now let's talk about some other things. Um, we're not doing it like C++. So what I'm going to show today is tremendously simpler than C++ constructors. And let's just talk about the reasons why, so that people aren't so confused about that later, right? So first of all, this is not trying to be an object-oriented language. So C++ has weird stuff about, you know, inheriting constructors and inheriting destructors, and those work differently from each other. And the order in which constructors walk substructs versus the order in which destructors walk substructs, none of that applies, because we're not, we don't have this paradigm of objects in the same way. You just have structs, and structs may have substructs, and that's it. Uh, so all that complexity, there's no, you know, you know, there's no multiple inheritance, there's just inclusion of, you know, substructs and so on. Um, so the semantics are boiled down to a much simpler thing. Um, Wizard of West March asked a question. Let's ask. Let's answer that question. The answer is kind of involved, so let's answer it at the end. Um, now, the the other thing that differs what I'm doing for C++ is that the way constructors work in C++ is based on some ideas that are related to OO but different and that are more granular, right? So, for example, if you're gonna, there was this idea even in the early days of C++ that if you're gonna construct an object or a data structure or whatever, then there's, sh well, you want to prevent bugs of somebody using that while it's in an invalid state, right? While it's not constructed yet. So the most surefire way to do that is to ensure that there is no way to express an invalid state of this object. And so, you know, if it needs 27 parameters, then you just make a constructor with 27 parameters. And by the time that constructor is done, then this very complex thing is initialized, and then you can use it fearlessly. That was the idea. Um, I think that that has proven to be a bad idea. Every time I've tried to do something like that, it became a dismal failure uh, because the complexity is just too high of what's being crammed into this constructor, and, you know, constructors fire at weird times, and you don't necessarily want complicated things to happen at those times sometimes. Um, and it's just like, in complex systems, it is often a lot easier to let things be in an invalid state for a while than to try to force them to be in a valid state by like cramming everything to need to happen all at one time when some of it's not ready to happen yet. So, so this has just been my uh, long-winded preliminary explanation to justify why I'm going to do a relatively simple version of constructors and destructors. And so with that, let's start looking at the code. Let's actually compile and run it. Let's prove that this compiles. Boom. Let's run it. Hey, look, it's another boring. Well, let, me, let me clear the thing. And there's no ambiguity about what's the output of the program. It's just doing a bunch of boring prints. And as we often do, we'll run down and look at this. Um, so we're going to start with this section, basics. And uh, this is just showing that there's constructors. So I have a thing. It's not unlike the thing that I showed before. Um, it's just got a couple values, and it's got a constructor and a destructor. And the way I define those is not by using the name of the class, like in C++, because you might want to change the name of the class, and you don't want to have more edits than you need. So it's just a constructor and a destructor directive. Um, there's only one, first of all. 
You can only ever specify one constructor and one destructor for a struct. Uh, we'll talk about why in a little bit. Um, well, I've already mostly talked about why, but we'll elaborate on that in a little bit. Um, so here's a construct thing. It's just a regular procedure, right? It's not defined in this guy anywhere. Um, and I say, hey, I'm using this thing, and I'm allocating mem, and I'm printing you know, the address of this thing, right? So a constructor, instead of being declared in the weird C++ member way, there's no members functions in this language, right? So it's just a constructor takes as its first argument a pointer to the thing it's constructing, right? And then here's a destructor as well. It's freeing memory and saying destructing the thing. And, uh, well, we don't actually destruct until later, but so we're constructing this thing at this address, and then we print done. Um, now, in addition to just being called statically by the program, uh, you know, this language has a lot of metadata availability in it, right? Um, oh, this is not incomplete anymore. I did that. I'm demoing that later, so that comment should not say incomplete. Um, so you, you recall that we have these type infos that describe the layout of anything. So for any struct, I can get the type info and I can print that. And so that's what this is. And you'll see here, um, there are fields called initialize, whoops, initializer, and that's a procedure with a pointer to the code, and then constructor and destructor, um, which are pointers to the code. Now, what are those? Well, the initializer is the thing that sets the value of this to 42. It's the thing that sets up all the constants that are sort of declared in the declaration of the struct. And then the constructor is this part, right? And the destructor is this part. Um, now, one reason why I separate those, well, there's two reasons. One is that at runtime, you may care a lot about which, you may want to do one and not the other, right? Um, but the second reason is just that uh, you may want to mix and match these routines. So you may want to, um, you may want to reuse this for multiple things. We'll show that later. And, and you may not, uh, well, it'll be obvious. All right, so anyway, we have this info along with all the other things that a type info contains, right? Like the name of the struct and what all the members are and who it was polymorphed from and all that good stuff. All right, so here's the thing too. And it's another thing, and I'm starting it out uninitialized. And I'm mem setting it to zero, because that's what I felt like. And then I'm going to print it. So we've got a thing to, and its value is zero, and its mem is zero, right? Because I mem setted the whole struct to zero. Uh, then um, I'm going to cast the initializer to the appropriate type, right? Because it's basically a void pointer on the type info, because the the type info is the same for all structs, so it can't know what type this parameter is supposed to be. So we're basically telling it what type this parameter is supposed to be in that it doesn't return anything. So we're basically casting these to the types that we want to use, and let's call them. So we call the initializer explicitly and print it after the initializer. And now value is 42 and mem is zero, right? Because the initializer didn't, or the mem didn't have a default value in the struct declaration. Then we call the constructor, and that prints constructing thing blah, and that's being printed out here. And then we print it after initializer and constructor, and you can see that mem now points to something because it got allocated, right? So first of all, this is, um, well, yeah. Now, <laughs> we're gonna show a more sophisticated version of using um, the pointers off this type info later. Uh, I just wanted to show that for now because people tend to ask, oh, how does this tie into type info and stuff? Um, but that's actually not the most convenient way to do it. If you know the type that you're dealing with at compile time, then you can say constructor of, initializer of, and destructor of, right? So I, I get each of those, and those are constants, right? So I use colon colons to get them, and then I print them, and here I'm printing them out, and you can see that those are all valid procedures. Um, now, these by themselves, the fact that you can get these pointers explicitly and that they're just regular pointers um, means that you can do whatever you want with them. So if you've seen previous demos, you'll know that this language used to have new and delete operators the way C++ did and the way other languages do. 
Um, and I did that way back then because I didn't really know what else to do. It was early in the design phase, right? But once you have this stuff, you have everything you need to implement new and delete at user level. So I said, all right, screw it. We're taking those out of the language and we're going to implement them as library routines. And then if you want to do something different in your new or your delete, you can just copy the library routine and mess around with it, right? So here I'm going to new a thing and I'm going to say t is blah just to prove that it worked. So there you go, thing with another memory location. Um, I'm printing out the value, I don't know why explicitly, and then I call delete down there and it's destructing thing uh, well, I never printed the address of this, but it's going to be this one, right? Because this is the one that's on the heap. These are the ones that's on the stack. So, so for these guys that we declared on the stack, they are each getting destructed down here at the end of the block. Um, and this one is on the heap, which is why its address is a very different number from these two. So let's take a look real fast. We won't dig into it very far, but let's go into here and see how new and delete are implemented. So new takes some default arguments. So, so it wants to know the type at compile time. That's what t is. Dollar sign means we need to know it at compile time, right? And we need to know if we're going to initialize it or not. And then this is the caller location, which you can use for debugging. I demoed that, I think, last time. And we just allocate some memory. And then if you want to initialize it, um, you know, if it's an array, we run over the array and construct everything. Otherwise, we just call the constructor once on the memory, right? And so construct is, for example, just gets the initializer and the constructor, right? And it inlines them, right? So you might think, oh, breaking it this into initializer and constructor has performance penalties, because now you have to call two functions every time. Well, no, because I'm saying inline call this and inline call that. So if there's an initializer on the struct, uh, we call it, otherwise we memset it to zero. So if you declare a struct and all members are zero, then the compiler will tell you that there's no initializer um, and you get null back when you ask for it, right? Which is why I'm doing this. Um, and then delete is the same, right? So it's simpler because you don't really have to do a lot. So I just say, what's the destructor? If it exists, call it inline and then free the pointer. And of course, this is polymorphic, so it runs on any type, right? This is polymorphic, so it runs on any type. OK. So is that is overloaded the next thing? Yeah. OK, so. The fact that you declare the constructor here um, might, if you start to think about what is the closure of that with all the other features of the language with regard to procedures, you might start asking, do those work? And the answer is yes, they all do. Almost all. There's one I got lazy about and didn't implement yet, but probably nobody will remember it and ask me about it. Okay, so, um, so for example, overloads work fine. So here I've got a constructor. I'm saying the constructor of entity is init, and I've got like four versions of init here that take different sets of arguments, but only one of them takes an entity pointer as the first argument, right? So, and it sets the name to hello sailor. So I'm just declaring an entity, the constructor gets called, and then I print entity is blah, right? And so that works, entity is entity with hello sailor, right? So that's fine, and that doesn't depend on order of declaration or anything. It works fine. It doesn't, these could be in global scope or mixed scopes, it all works. It all works exactly like I demoed overloading in previous times. Um, so instead of, instead of just listing an identifier here, you might just list the text of the procedure instead, right? So here I'm showing that. So I've got an entity two, and it, I'm doing this thing where you count up the serial number every time. And it's got a constructor, and I didn't want to refer to an external procedure. I'm just writing the body of the procedure. So, you know, there's an E that's a pointer to an entity two, and we're using it so we can just say, just like a this, uh, serial equals get next serial. And get next serial just counts up this global serial number and returns it, right? And then the destructor just prints what the entity serial we're doing, and I make three of them. A, B, and C, and if this is working correctly, they should have increasing serials. And indeed they do, one, two, three, right here. Um, now, uh, I should have demoed just straight up polymorphism, 
I guess. I forgot to do that. Uh, but that works. And you know that that works because frickin' click quick lambda works, which is a syntactic sugar for a polymorphic lambda, right? So uh, here's an entity three. Again, it's got a serial number and it's got a constructor and the constructor is a quick lambda. We just say, we take x, which is the pointer to entity three, and we just say x.serial is inline get next serial, right? So very brief little constructor that does what we want. And then we do d, e, and f as entity threes, and that works as well. Right? So again, if you're from some through through heavy runtime non-statically typed language, you might think that this is not a statically typed procedure, but it is, right? So this is syntactic sugar for a polymorphic argument that's got, you know, some x of some type t, and every time you call it, uh, you know, it gets compiled at compile time for that type, right? So this is just as strongly typed as you know, in the end, as C, right? So it's like a C++ template function in that same way. Um, there's no runtime magic happening here at all. This is all compile time. Um, okay, so let's talk about reuse. Um, so here I've got a function called compute. It's a quick lambda. So I map S, and I just say whatever S is, I'm going to set its Z component to X squared plus Y times X minus 3. So I'm just doing some goofy polynomial of the coefficients of this thing. And then I want to reuse that on a bunch of things. So I'm saying, hey, the constructor of math int is compute, right? And math int is some type that has x as an int, and y as an int, and z is the same type of x, whatever that is. And I'm declare a as a math int and show that compute works on that, right? So here we go. So z is 18, which is what you get when you evaluate this on three and four. So again, for all these examples, these first two are always going to be three and four because the constructs, constructor doesn't change that at all. Um, only z gets set here, right? So we, then we have a float version, and we're using compute, which is the same declaration, right? But it gets polymorphed differently in this case. So here we've got the float version, 3.0, 4.0, 18.0, and we've got a mixed now where x is a float 64 and y is an int, right? And we do the same thing. So this is just to show that, you know, the interoperation of polymorphism with constructors. Um, I believe I'm... Yeah, we're here now. Um, optional argument usage. So up till now, I've been showing constructors that have one argument, but like I said, it interoperates generally with procedures. So here again, we've got a math int. It does a polynomial again. Um, someone's asking, I'll answer that question about omitting the x dot again in the Q&A, because it'll derail the discussion right now. Um, and let's just hold all questions till the end. It's, it's more organized that way for people who are going to watch on YouTube later. Uh, okay, so here we've got, the, and also it's hard for me to notice questions as they come up on the chat. Um, so this is a slightly different function though, because instead of hard coding all the coefficients, we're now passing them in as default parameters. Um, uh, but this still works. So we say the constructor is compute, and so when I construct this, um, you know, it must be running something, and what it's doing is it's passing the pointer to the math int as m, and then it's just taking the defaults for these, because constructors don't supply other values. Um, so, uh, here we go. Right, so after construction, a is blah, blah, blah. So now I'm going to call the same routine to show that there's no magic constructor juice in this function, and it's just a regular function. I'm going to call this function um, with different arguments for x, y scale and trailing constant, and I should get a different answer. So I call it with those, and after calling that, uh, yes, I get a different z. So that just goes to show that unlike C++, right, the constructor doesn't have other weird code wrapped up in it. You can just call that anytime you want, because it's, it's just a function. There's no weird constructor juice. All right. Now you might ask, well then, how do I call, how do I construct a, and pass different values for these guys at construction time? 
And the answer is right now I do not give you a syntax to do that. Uh, and the reason is that I want to minimize use of constructors because I think they're a complication that I would rather not have. And so I think if you know that you want to do something more interesting or more involved than the default construction, then just call a regular function on it. Don't try to use constructor magic. Um, so yeah, there's no, there's no like this kind of thing, right? Um, in fact, actually, the syntax for this right now, or the syntax for the language, would interpret this as parameters to this type, right? Because when you parameter as a struct, you s supply the parameters with the parentheses. So yes. That isn't a decision that some people may disagree with, but uh, I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible while being as feature-rich as possible. Um, that said, it is not a, a very large modification to the language to provide a way to give arguments like that. So if we decide it's super useful, we can do it. But for now, I'm just being super minimal. Well, along certain dimensions, I'm being super minimal. Um, so here I've got a proc that's verargs, and in fact, it's not even verargs of a pointer to some things, right? It's a verarg of anys. So if you remember, in one of the very first demos, I showed what happens. Any is a way of wrapping an arbitrary type so that you get the information about the type and a pointing to its value, right? So the constructor can be this verargs proc, right? So I make a something, and so first the constructor runs. So let's show that. Um, we say verargs proc got one arguments, and we for every argument we print it out, and uh, it just says x sub zero equals this, which is the pointer to the thing, right? Um, here, um, just to show that it does different things, um, I'm calling it with this struct by value now, which is different. The constructor passed a pointer to it, and this is passing it by value, and again, uh, you know, it shows that, uh, and here. Um, here, I'm just passing it with a pointer to show this is the same as the constructor. For some reason, when I did this demo, I was brain dead and I just didn't show it as a full verargs proc. So let me do that. Um, I'll go verargs, not vargargs, verargs proc. Um, one, two, three, hello, sailor uh, 69105.0, and uh, something, right? just to show that it should take all these things and, oh, what did I do? Oh, at the bottom of the file. I left this junk at the bottom of the file. All right, for a minute I thought I had a, let's clear. For a minute I thought I had a dreaded like demo failure. Laser no good. Okay, where, where is it? Where is it? Okay, so here we go. Just to prove that this is a regular verargs proc and there's nothing crazy happening, we're printing all the arguments, it, it knows the type, it just all freaking works, right? So that's great. Great! Okay, um, I think next is array demo, so or array test. So we've got these constructors. Um, they work when you declare one of them, for example. Okay, actually, let me make a point before I talk about this. There is only one time that constructors ever fire. In C++, there's at least two times, right? In C++, if you declare something on the stack or you say new, that's when the constructors run. But we don't have a new in the language. It's just a standard library routine that calls the constructor. So the only time a constructor will ever automatically run is when you declare something on the stack, okay? So we declared things as a scalar on the stack, but here we're just showing that you can do arrays of them and the constructors will work right on the array, right? So here, We've got a constructor that just sets the value to a random number and prints something, prints the address, and the destructor prints the address. And here we've got an array of four of these anti fours, and we're gonna see those constructors fire off. In fact, here they are, boom, 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 boom. We have random values each time. And then we print a sub one, just to prove that it's there. Uh, and then we do a two-dimensional array just to show that that works. So here's 16 guys, all with different random numbers, and you see the addresses going upward in a very orderly way, and here we print sub three, sub two. So that works as you would expect. Another thing that you would expect to work is having a struct that contains structs. So in fact, here's a bag 
it contains an item, which is a thing that has a constructor that prints something out. Um, and we've got an array. We only not only have one by value, we've got like a, an array of six by value. And then the bag itself has its own constructor, right? And so, you know, what you might expect is for the constructors of these to fire and then this one to fire. And that's exactly what happens. So, uh, where are we? Okay. So here we're constructing one of the items and then this array of How many is that? Oh, it's not running seven. Maybe there's a bug. I'll have to look into that. Anyway, um, I don't. I feel like it. It should print seven, six for these and one for this. But I only see six here, unless I'm hallucinating. Someone's saying that four four entity array initialize the first four entities twice. No, it didn't. Just once. Right. This is this is the oh you mean the, the two dimensional one? No. Uh, this is the one dimensional array here. This is this one. This is this one. And then these are the destructors. Um, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Right, you would expect 20 destructors, and that's how many you see. So these 16 fire, and then these 4 fire. Or is it the other way around? No, it's, it's these and then these. So that works. However, I think there's a bug here. I think there's legit a bug, and I don't know why it happens. So I'm going to make a note to look that up. Um, but anyway, um, so here we've got this array of six other items. And um, these constructing items get printed uh, because those are being constructed. Uh, the initializer sets the name to an item. And then the constructor for bag runs, which sets uh, item two to hello and item four to sailor. And then we iterate over all the items and print them out. And there we go. And the fact that this happens after these shows that this constructor ran after these constructors. Someone is still... Oh, wait. No, you're right. Okay, yeah, no, you're right. There's a bug, man. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah, okay, that's not right. Okay, well, I've got two bugs I have to fix as soon as the demo's over. Let me write this down. I should have I should have tested more thoroughly before the demo. Uh, good eye to catch that. Because I was running that for a long time and never noticed. Because the numbers are different and you just scan down and you're like, oh, they're different. Um, but basically the, the point is, if you look at the addresses of these, they're the same as the addresses of these. And there's 20 here. So like, yeah, these four, these four are running twice for some reason. And it's, it's just a bug. Like there's, there's an off by one in you know, when I run an n-dimensional loop to generate the code to call these constructors. So it'll be like a five-minute fix, but it's a bug. And then this one, I don't know why that's happening. All right. Uh, we'll have those fixed by the end of the night. So, uh, so we have substructs. We'll be demoing next. Uninitialized. Right. So this is a little bit like the thing because early on I demoed something that's explicitly uninitialized, but this is just to show like, hey, that works. So this runs a constructor for thing. Uh, this doesn't run a constructor for thing, but now I'm making an alternate constructor that allocates a different amount of space. Right. So if you remember, 
construct thing allocated 1,000 bytes, and here we're allocating 2,000. And so um, we're calling those. That's, this is a little bit redundant with what I showed. Uh, it's just it's just to show that if you want greater control over what exactly happens, you can say no, don't construct this one. I'm going to construct it and then run your own code on it. Right. That's all that is. So I promised uh, I might fix the bugs live later on in a live stream. We might do that. I just don't want to derail the demo to fix the bugs because they're relatively trivial bugs, I, I say now. Okay. Um, dynamic instances. So I promised before a more sophisticated version of using the type info. So I, this is not like a fully real world uh, example, but what I'm doing is I'm saying, you know, let's say we deserialized some information about what we want to construct, right? So we have, we started with no uh, compile time knowledge of what the type is. It's a common thing that might happen in a game engine, right? You load a level that's got some information about some entities and you just have to like read in what all the entities are and you have to construct them in the world, right? And how do you do that in this system? So I'm starting, let's just say somehow we were able to map to an index within the type table of the program. So there's various ways that you could do that, but you know we managed to do that. So I'm just going to pass the index in the type table to this procedure called dynamic instance, right? And just show. So here, first we know that we're constructing a thing, um, but dynamic dynamic instance doesn't know we're constructing a thing, so it has to get from the index back to the type. So here, and again, this is just a slightly different version of the things that we've looked at. So we get the type table, we get the type info out of the table. So this is the same as what you would get if you said type info of a particular type. Um, we're asserting that we passed a struct because that's all that we want to deal with here. And then we, we print the name of the struct. So calling dynamic instance for struct thing, so you see that that worked. Um, then we allocate memory equal to its runtime size, right? If we ran out of memory or our allocator you know, di didn't give us any, then we return failure. Um, we get the initializer in the constructor. Here, uh, I can't use hash if, and I can't use colon colon because these things aren't known at compile time, right? So here I'm just saying read this field off the uh, type info struct, right? Type info struct. Give me the initializer and give me the constructor, and then we print out what they are. And so this shows that that's working. Um, if we again, we, if we have an initializer, use it. Otherwise, memset to zero. And if we have a constructor, call that. I'm not bothering to inline them here. And then we return that. So this is just at the end of this, we print out the thing, and you see that it's correctly initialized at values 42, and the memory is blah blah blah. So we went from no runtime knowledge of what we were going to construct to a valid uh, instance of this thing, and we did it with basically no code of our own. Right, we're just using the metadata provided to us by the compiler. This is the kind of thing where if you were gonna do this in C++, it's painful. Uh, it takes a lot of work. All right, and then just to prove that that works, let's do it for a second type. So I, get, I have this type called Globo up here. It's got a one, two, three, four, right? And it's got different, it says pre-main and post-main constructor and destructor, but uh, here, we're not doing it in global scope. Uh, that's a thing we'll talk about in a second. Um, so it says pre-main constructor running, but it's not running pre-main. Um, but just look, look, we're constructing a globo, right? Um, now, this is to show that the constructor correctly ran as well, because the value is 99, which you might say, wait a minute, the value is supposed to be 1.234, but actually the, the constructor pokes a 99 in there. So that's where that comes from. OK. Now let's talk about something more complicated regarding uh, optional arguments. Um, in this language, when you call a procedure with optional arguments, um, the caller fills them in. 
right? So, you know, it, it's not like some languages might do a weird thing where you jump into different parts of that procedure based on, based on which arguments you were providing or whatever. We don't do that. Uh, what we do is the caller provides all the arguments and if some of them were optional, then, uh, you know, the compiler just fills them in in the, in the uh, calling convention and so on. Um, so we're going back to this example where we have this local math int thing. And we've got this constructor compute just like before and it's got optional arguments, right? So we already did this. Um, and here, uh, I'm, I'm making the point that, how do I say this? Okay, if these constructors only ever got called at compile time, there would be no problem at all because the compiler can just, when it calls the constructor automatically on a local math int, pass these arguments, right? However, at runtime, if you're going to do a thing like we just did with dynamic instances, um, you're going to do something like this. If there's a constructor, call it. You don't know if there's default arguments or how many there are. You don't know anything about this constructor, right? You don't know what to pass here, and there's no way for the compiler to do it. I mean, we could do something really arcane and weird. Uh, that'd be super disgusting, where the compiler recognizes a special function. We're trying to stay away from that kind of thing, right? Um, the other thing that could happen here is there could be some stuff on the type info for the struct that gives you the type signature of the constructor, and then you would have some massive library routine that you call to like poke in the correct default values that uses that information to figure it out. We could have done that. That would have been a viable way to do it. I didn't like that. It seemed too complicated. So instead, uh, what happens is, when you have a situation like this, where there's a constructor, and it's pointed at something with more than one argument, uh, then in addition to, you know, compiling this constructor for you, um, we also make a forwarding constructor that only takes one argument so that if you're going to call it at runtime here, um, then uh, you only ever need to worry about one argument. And so the thing that we actually get here for this constructor is a forwarder that fills in these arguments uh, and then calls this guy. So uh, here, what I'm doing is I'm printing compute, which will give us the address of this thing. And then I'm printing the constructor of local math int. And these will be different addresses. And this is just to show that this is different because it's the forwarder. I should have maybe done this in other cases where they're the same, but whatever. You can imagine them being the same. Uh, where are we? Here we go. So this is like blah, 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 CF210. And this is blah, 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 CE590. So different procedures in different places. Um, and again, to show that that works, uh, I'm getting the index in the type table. I'm calling dynamic instance and then printing it out. Uh, and so we get a valid local math int back with the correct computation performed. And that worked by calling into the forwarder, which then called up to the full constructor. Okay. New and delete replacements. Um, you know, I already basically showed this because we looked at new and delete. Um, you know, th there's a question of what what should it look like to make arrays of things in whatever. Um, for now, I was just goofing around with uh, making a thing called new array and delete array. You know, so new array basically does what you expect. You, you give it how many things and the type and whether you want to initialize and it allocates that many things and you know blah 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 and calls construct array which just iterates over the thing. You can imagine unrolling this loop in certain conditions and whatnot. Um, but this is just a very brain dead implementation. Um, I haven't gone well that's about every case that you could cover. Because if you start to think about, oh, what if the things in this array uh, have substructs? And what if they have subarrays? Um, those are already sort of handled by this stuff, I think. Um, actually, no, they're not quite. Multidimensional arrays are not quite.
quite handled by this. A small change would fix it, but structs with substructs and all that are handled by this current code because um, when you call the initializer for a struct, it initializes the substructs. When you call a constructor for a struct, it calls the constructors of the substructs. Um, I just, you know, it's a small amount of work to get this up to like a full thing that handles everything, and I just didn't want to bother yet. I'll do it when I need it. Um, the other thing to point out is that you have the freedom to not call destructors if you don't want to. So here, I made a new array of five things, and then I just freed it without calling the destructors, and that works because, again, the destructor, the code for the destructor is not tied to memory deallocation in any way. It doesn't know anything about deallocation um, of, of the block of the thing itself, right? So you're free to manage it in any way you want. Um, and here, this is just another example with bag and all these constructors, and this subarray of things, and showing that that works. So, you know, here we knew a bag and it's got the items. It's still getting only six items. There's just an off by one in array iteration, that's all it is. Uh, okay, and then we do the same, it's the same code as before, so it's got the same output as before. Now, I had these globos. The last thing I print at the end of main is just to show that these globos are initialized. And what are those? Well, I have an array of four globos in the global namespace, and as just as in C++, these will construct and destruct correctly. Uh, so when the program starts up, we'll see pre-main constructors running, and when it shuts down, we'll see pre-main, post-main destructors running. So those are the destructors. Uh, here's the constructors. And, uh, you know, we print out the value of one of them just to show that it's initialized. Uh, so that is exactly what you would expect as well. Um, I've toyed around with the idea of allowing you to set a build option that prevents the automatic uh, calling of pre-main and post-main stuff and enables you to call them yourself on your own time because you might want to, you know, do something at the beginning of main before these things get initial initialized. Uh, I haven't done that yet. I'm not sure if it's necessary uh, because my opinion is sort of uh, just don't do anything order dependent in your global objects, but we'll see. We'll see if it becomes necessary. Uh, and that's it. That's all that I wanted to show. It's pretty straightforward, uh, but the reason of, you know, I wanted to get this out of the way so we can do awesome features next time. So, are there questions about what was shown here? Someone is asking, can you write constructor bake values in my function default arg equals two? Yeah, you should be able to. I haven't tried it. Um, let me try it. Is there any reason why that wouldn't? How? And you know what? I might not parse that. And I'm not sure if bake values works. I might have let bake values rot for a while. Let's see what happens. Let's just, at the end of main, let's, let's just, first of all, f foo is a uh, um, takes a thing and uh, an int, and we're going to say x.value equals y, right? Say foo thing is a foo thing is a thing. Foo of foo thing 77. Print foo is, okay, this won't do anything exciting yet. This is just boring, right? Okay, foo is blah, blah, blah. Wait, what? No, I don't want to print foo. Let me put some new lines after this. To make it easy to spot. Uh, and let's get rid of the globos for now, because 
well, then we don't need to do this. Okay, so I, I want this to be the last thing in the output. I didn't want to print foo, I wanted to print foo thing. Thing, all right. Oh, fine, we'll leave the globos, whatever. All right, so that work, this procedure works. Now, I'm gonna say bar is bake values foo y equals minus 69105. Let's just see if that even works. Wait, that's the wrong syntax. I think it's bake values foo, I think it's that. Piled. All right, so now let's just see if this works. Um, bar thing is a thing. Bar, bar thing. So we've curried, functional language people call this currying, right? So we've curried this procedure down to one with fewer arguments that's hard coded. And then I'm going to print bar thing is this. Okay, 69, minus 69.105. Now, uh, try me is a struct. No. Let me just make a local struct called thing. Right? This is just going to shadow our other thing. Okay, this is all fine. It still works. So the reason I'm shadowing it is so I can set the constructor without messing with the rest of the program. Um, I don't know if I can do this in local scope. Let's see what happens. Oh, okay. It's complaining that it must be a constant procedure. The thing is, um, oh wait, bar thing, that's not a procedure. <laughs> bar. Okay, well that worked. All right, so um, if I just do this, let's just get rid of these. And we're gonna say, um, t is a thing, print t is blah. So if this works, then um, this is just going to get the default constructor. The default constructor is bar, uh, which should set the value, right? So let's try that. So that works. So then let's try the original question. Uh, which is just this. Instead of saying constructor bar, we say constructor that. I don't know. I don't know if I parse that. Is the only thing. Um, I guess I do. <sighs> okay. So that makes up for me having a bug earlier in the demo. The fact that the fact that all that worked the first time is great. Okay, now I'll look for other questions. I feel like I want to include that in the main talk, so 